Welcome to the Lift Your Story podcast with guest Michelle Kull. Left 17 year career in the legal field to follow her dreams of writing, speaking, and teaching. Hi, everyone. I am Laurieann. I am that gal from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, and I'm with. I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to our Lift Your Story podcast. In this episode, we welcome Michelle Culp. She left a 17-year career in the legal field to follow her dreams of being of writing, speaking, and teaching. Thank you so much for being here with us. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. Well, okay, we got to start right off out of the gate with your Billy Ray Cyrus story, please. Awesome. Well, people often ask me, you know, how did how did you leave the legal field and what happened? And, you know, how did you end up where you did? So I always give credit to Billy Ray Cyrus. And so the story was I was a paralegal for 17 years in litigation. And like many people, I experienced what I call career creep. And career creep is when you lo you love a job and you love everything you do, but over time, the tasks that you do slowly change and you wake up one day, you're like, I hate my job. And people don't understand like why all of a sudden they hate their job because slowly the job changed. So the tasks that I used to do when I first started in the law career, which was legal research and legal writing, which I loved, I wasn't doing that at the end. I, I, I felt like a glorified gopher and I wasn't happy. And as fate would have it, I was given the pink slip from the law firm that I worked at. And they said, um, it was, it, they said something like, um, the department you worked in um, is changing and your job no longer exists. And here's some severance pay, see you later. Uh, again, I wasn't happy, uh, but I was a single parent living paycheck to paycheck with three young kids. So I didn't really feel like I could just quit my job. So they kind of helped me out. It was a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. And um, I was fortunate um, to, um, to have this, this uh, meeting with Billy Ray Cyrus that really helped me find my dream. Um, I had a neighbor, you know, when, I don't know if you guys remember when Achy Breaky Heart came out, it was 1992 and uh, sort of overnight he sold 17 million copies and all of a sudden he went from like, you know, unknown to this, you know, this big star with Achy Breaky Heart. Uh, a neighbor of mine gave me the tape. Um, I think it was a tape. I don't think it was a, D a CD or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, my kids loved the song and um, we would dance around my, my house and it, it just really lifted us up. And then my friend said, hey, you know, he's playing at the Patriot Center in Fairfax, Virginia on October 23rd. That happened to be my birthday. And I said, oh my God, I'm gonna meet Billy Ray Cyrus. He has something important to tell me and uh, it's gonna change my life. Now, my friends all thought I was delusional. They were like, Michelle, you're not meeting Billy Ray. You're insane. What are you talking about? I said, no, he's playing on my birthday. Like it means something. I'm gonna meet him. And I was a little bit delusional because at, the, at that time in my life, I had three young kids living paycheck to paycheck, going through divorce, getting fired from the law firm. My older brother was diagnosed with AIDS and was dying. And I was very, very stressed out. And so he was like the light, you know, like the bright light in the dark tunnel that I was in. And I just said, I'm going to meet Billy Ray. And um, I went and bought tickets for me and my girlfriend to go to this concert. And after the concert, I got kicked out four times trying to get backstage to meet Billy Ray Cyrus. Um, but that, was, that wasn't enough to give up. So um, we get kicked out and we're now outside the Patriot Center. And I said, you know what? Billy Ray will come out here because there was all these fans outside. He'll come out and he's going to sign autographs and I'm going to meet him. So we kind of wait um, for Billy Ray to come out. And he did. He was in a limo and he was like out the roof of the limo. And he was he was um, signing autographs and talking to everyone. And I was so excited. And, and my friend, I said to my friend, listen, we're just going to follow the limo when it leaves here. Wherever Billy go, Billy Ray goes, we're following him. She's like, Michelle, you're crazy. This is a crazy thing. I said, whatever. We're going to meet Billy Ray. So we wait till he's done, you know, with all the fans. And we follow him blindly. Like he could have been going to Texas or wherever. I don't know where he was going, but we just follow the limo onto the highway. And this is really before cell phones and you know social media and all that stuff. There wasn't a lot of that going on. So me and my girlfriend are in the car, but guess what? There was all these other women following the limousine. We were, it was like 50 of them. It was like an Elvis scene. They were all, we were all following the limo and we ended up at the Hilton Hotel in Fairfax, Virginia. 
And my girlfriend, she, she didn't even care about Billy Ray, but she got crazy and caught up in it. She jumps out of the moving car and starts running to the side um, of the hotel door to chase Billy Ray down as I went to go park the car. And all these women rushed in the, the, the side door of the hotel and Billy Ray's there with his bodyguard signing autographs. He's in the elevator. I go park the car. Now, I do want to point out that I wore a red, I was 29 years old. I wore a red spandex dress with red pumps because I wanted to stand out from all the country girls. I was like, I got to get Billy Ray to notice me. So I, um, I walked in and Billy Ray looked outside the elevator and he literally pulled me in the elevator with him. And um, he, uh, saw, I had a book with me. You're not going to believe this book. It was called Creative Visualization by Shakti Gwain. And I had visualized me meeting Billy Ray and him talking to me and changing my life. And he signed my book and he signed the t-shirt. He gave me a rose. And then the bodyguard literally like pushed me out of the elevator. And he said, all right, enough, everybody. Billy Ray signed all these, you know, autographs. He's going upstairs for the night. Good night. And he pushed me out of the elevator and they went upstairs and I'm standing there with my friend and all these women, these fans who wanted, you know, wanted to, uh, I guess, whatever with, you know, talk more to Billy Ray and Jackie, my friend said, well, what are you, what are we going to do? And I said, we got to get rid of the competition. Let's pretend like we're leaving and get rid of all these women. Then we come back in we get, we'll come up with a new plan. So we just pretended like we left and it was weird. All the women left. And about 10 minutes later, we came back in. Now, I, in my in college years, I was a cocktail waitress at the Sheridan Hotel, and I used to meet all the celebrities, um, Van Halen, David Lee Roth, Eddie Van Halen, a lot, of, um, a lot of the wrestlers. I used to walk up the WWF wrestlers because they all stayed at this hotel. So I kind of knew, like, the, like the back, the, the, you know, how they did things in the background. So I said to my friend, Jackie, listen, usually they block out the floor on the elevator where the star is staying. So I said, let's push all the buttons in the elevator and see if there's a blocked out floor. And it was 15 floors, I think, on, on that hotel. And so we pushed all the buttons and they all lit up. And she's like, well, now what? And I'm like, well, we just, we'll just go look for clues, you know? And so we go to like the 15th floor, nothing. The 14th floor, nothing. There is no 13th floor. It was bad, bad luck, I guess. We get to the 12th floor and I saw the bodyguard go in the last door. And I said, oh my God, this is the floor. Billy Ray's on this floor. And I start walking down the hallway with my friend, Jackie. The bodyguard heard us, came out. I started coming up with some story of how, you know, some sob story of how I needed to meet Billy Ray. And he goes, listen, I have heard every story. You're just a groupie who wants to meet him and you're not going to meet Billy Ray. And I'm going to call the police and security if you don't leave. And I started arguing him. I mean, I'm in the legal field. That's what we do. We argue. So, and I'm Italian. So we're, I'm like arguing with him and, and Jackie's like, Michelle, I don't want to get arrested. Like I, we really need to go. And I was like, fine. So we go back to the elevator. Bodyguard goes in his room. And Jackie goes, what are we going to do? And I said, Jackie, the only thing standing between me and Billy Ray is a hallway. We can't give up now. We're so close. She's like, you're crazy. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. So um, I look over and there was um, a plaque and it said room 1210 to 1223. And now the, build, the bodyguard went in the last door. So, and then there was a house phone on this little table. You know, this is the old days. I don't know. They had a house phone and the, and the plaque. And I just picked up the phone and I dialed the, the last number on the plaque, 1223. Billy Ray answers the phone. It was his, it was his room. And I said, um, I, and I had told him it was my birthday too when I was in the elevator. And he, he answered the phone and I, he said, who is this? And I said, it's the birthday girl. And he said, do you mean the girl in the red dress? And I said, yes, the girl in the red dress. And he goes, where are you? I said, listen, your bodyguard is like trying to get me arrested. I'm on your floor. I can see your door. And he said, well, well, you know, what, what's, what's going on? I said, I said, it's my dream to meet you and talk to you. And, um, and it's my birthday, you know? And so he said, well, listen, he goes, yeah, the bodyguard's job is to keep women away from me. Um, but he goes, I got to tell you something crazy that you won't believe. And I was like, what? And he's like, I was going to invite you upstairs to talk, but, you know, with all those women around and my bodyguard, you know, and I said, well, I'm here now. 
And so um, I didn't go to his room that second because he actually hurt his back on stage. And he said, I'm, I have a masseuse coming up, my back's hurt, but you know, if you're still up, you know, when I'm done, then, you know, he is what, where, what number can I call you on? I didn't have a cell phone. So I give him the number We're at the holiday Inn down the road. I give him the phone number and the room number me and Jackie leave. We go back to the holiday Inn. it's literally like two in the morning now. And Jackie's like, do you think Billy Ray is going to call? I'm like, I don't know. We're listening. We're listening to achy breaky heart. We're dancing in the hotel room. I'm like, you know, hoping that the guy's going to call me. And about, I don't know, I think maybe it was like three in the morning, Billy Ray calls and um, he goes, is this the birthday girl? And he said, what's your birthday wish? And I said, just to meet, meet you and talk to you in person. And he said, well, I'm done with, you know, whatever. And um, you can come over. So I get in my car. Now, Jackie didn't come with me. She's like, I don't even care about Billy Ray. You go do whatever. So I get in my car. I drive back to the Hilton Hotel. I go up to the 12th floor. I'm walking down the hallway and the bodyguard heard me. I think his name was Steed. He comes out and he starts yelling at me. He was, he was, he just wanted to go to sleep. And I was now, you know, um, preventing him from sleeping. And he comes out and um, Billy Ray left his door just a teeny bit open. And I said, I swear, you know, Billy Ray invited me. He actually called me, told me to come up. And he's like, wait right here, you know, and he was so pissed. And he went in and he talked to Billy Ray and he goes, go in. And I, I went in the room and it was very interesting because it was like, here he was on stage with these thousands of fans and he was just sitting there watching the news. It was kind of like a lonely existence, you know, after this big concert and this adrenaline and he's just sitting there by himself watching the news. He had like Emmy and water and a fruit tray. I don't know. I just remembered all these weird things. And um, we ended up just having a norm, you know, I stayed there for about two or three hours. We talked like you would when you get to know somebody and um he had two sides to billy ray and one was the very spiritually enlightened side he came from a long line of ministers and there were people that believed that billy ray had healing powers and they would bring like six children to him to touch kind of like they did with elvis and i don't know you know if that was true or not but he did have a very spiritually enlightened side but he also had that like cocky side like i am god's gift to women you know and all that stuff but I was like, I'm, I'm not, I'm here, like, you know, because he has something important to say and that's going to change my life. So as we were talking, Billy Ray said, listen, they're calling me an overnight success. And he said, I'm not an overnight success. I've been playing music my whole life. It's my passion. It's my heart. And even if they take away the fame, the fortune, the money, I'm still playing music because it's my passion. It's my dream. And he said, what's your dream? And I said, I don't have any dreams. My life's about survival. And I was in survival mode and I, I, I was so miserable and so unhappy. I didn't know, like, I didn't have time to think about dreams when well, you're trying to figure out how to pay the rent, how to pay the electric bill and, you know, how to put food on the table for the kids. And he said, Michelle, I want you to promise me. He said, everybody has a dream. It might be locked up inside you, but I want you to promise me that you'll go out, find this dream and never, ever, ever give up on it. And so I made this promise to Billy Ray Cyrus and I said, I'm, I, I will, I'll do that. And um, it literally took me a year after I, after that meeting, you know, I was like, all right, Billy Ray said, I have a dream, but I don't know what it is. And I kind of felt sorry for myself because I thought like everybody had a dream, but I didn't know what mine was. So I was at the bookstore, Borders Bookstore, and this little book fell into my, hair, my hand. It was a year later and it was called How to Find Your Mission in Life by Richard Bowles. Now, Richard Bowles wrote a big book called What Color Is Your Parachute that a lot of people know about finding, you know, the right career. But a lot of people don't know about that little book called How to Find Your Mission in Life. And there was a sentence that changed that helped me find my dream. And it said, what do you love to do where you lose all sense of time? And when I read the sentence, I was like, when I was a kid, I liked writing poetry and short stories and essays and reports for school. And I could just sit in my room and read books and write. And I said, I guess writing is my passion. That's my dream. And I pursued um, becoming a writer. I ended up being a reporter for the Capital Gazette newspaper. I ended up writing a manuscript and got a call from one of the top five publishing companies in New York, even though they turned me down because I didn't have a PhD, they said to write self-help books, but that was the old days where, you know, they were, it was competitive and they said, well, if you got a PhD, we'd publish it, but you don't, so we're not. Um, so I, I pursued my writing 
you know, dream, but, you know, I got a lot of roadblocks. And then finally Amazon came along and I was like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to self-publish. It was 2011. And I self-published a book and a year later I had zero sales. And I was like, wait a minute. I don't think I understand Amazon or how this whole thing works. And I went to a event. It was National Speakers Association. I was part of that in DC. And I met this woman who was doing a workshop called how to become an Amazon bestselling author. And I told her about my book and no sales. And she goes, yeah, you don't understand. You have to be on a bestsellers list if, if you want to get found. So I wrote another book called Never Work Again, Six Secrets to Making a, a Playcheck Instead of a Paycheck. And I launched that book. I had 20, 2,100 sales in one day, became a bestselling author. The book started selling. I used it as a lead magnet for my courses and my coaching. And then people started coming to me saying, can you help me write a book? Can you help me be a bestseller? And that's how in 2013, the Amazon bestselling author program was born. But before we get into that, for those who are watching on video, if you can see me, this is 1992, follow your dreams. That is me and Billy Ray. This is literally in the elevator. So um, probably on a Kodak camera, you know, back in, back in the old days, but that's me with my eighties hair, my red, uh, my red dress. You can see, see me now. And, um, Billy Ray is the reason I now have over 22 books. I always talk about him in most of my books. I tell the Billy Ray story, but he really changed my life. And, um, you know, and that question really is what helped me find my, my dream and my passion. Love it. Love that story. Thank that's you. Very determined. <laughs> Very what? Determined. <laughs> yeah, that's what a lot of people said. They were like, you don't give up. And I said, yeah, I'm definitely the, the legal field. You have to fight and you have to like when when there's, you know, a roadblock, you just got to find 10 more ways to do it like that. That's what I learned in the legal field is like you don't give up. You just find new ways to do it. I have a feeling, though, regardless of even if you hadn't gone to that extreme, it would have happened. And I want to say this really quickly. Your story is way bigger than mine, but um, <laughs> I, I love, and, and a lot of people pick on them, but Nickelback loved it. 2004. I love Nickelback. Love them. And uh, 2004, I got tickets with my three kids and we were in the very back row. I'm going to try to make this really short, but my daughter and I, we were singing into my little recorder thing and the red light was on and they took me down to security. Yeah. And then at the very end, but what's weird is that I, my, I said to my, my kids, I told my daughter in particular, I said, I'm going to meet Chad. I am going to meet him. So then she says to me, and we're very back row, seriously, to the point where we could get behind the, the fence and dance because there was the walkway. And she goes, mom, are you going to meet Chad tonight? And I said, honey, I said, that, that would be a miracle because they're all the way down there. Those little things that you see on stage at that step. <laughs> But at the end of it, security, I said, you know, I said, keep the recorder, whatever. I don't care. Just I need to get back to my kids. Well, the end of the day, we went down. They said, meet us at gate 18. And there was that the numbers, right? Like you're saying 1223. There's your 23, your birthday and all of that. Yes. Well, out came Chad listening to our my daughter and I making idiots of ourselves and singing someday somewhere. And I just sat there and my kids were just sitting there staring. She goes, mom, see, you said you were going to meet them. Oh my God. But that's that's what I'm saying. You feeling that way. I believe that we're like, I love that you were that determined, but I believe that you would have met him anyway. Thank you. Yeah, really? it, it was, it was pretty crazy, but I get, I guess, you know, I learned a lot of lessons about, you know, sometimes a lot of people quit five minutes before, you know, the dream happens, right? They're like, well, I've, I've been working on this for years. I've tried this, this, and this, it didn't work. And I say, well, what's your IQ? What's your I quit moment? Like, if you have an I quit moment, then you're not all in. In fact, we're doing a book right now, a multi-author book called All In, where we're having 30 authors write their all in story. Of So I literally went all in with that. Like, there was no time, like, Jackie was like, well, you know, we got kicked out. Let's just go back. And I'm like, no, we're not quitting. We're like, we got to figure this out. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's an amazing story. I just love it. That is so great. Tell us about 28 books to 100K. Okay, so um, because, you know, writing is my passion and um, and to the end of 2019, before COVID hit, I read this article on Written Word Media. That's a blog and um, they're also book promoters. And the article said, if you want to make six figures in passive income, the average author who makes six figures has 28 books. 
And I thought, gosh, I only have like six books right now on Amazon. And, and I just thought, I'm going to write a book a month for a year and then we'll see what happens. I mean, it was kind of an insane thought. I don't know why I decided that. But they say when you make plans, God laughs. My two-year-old granddaughter moved in with me and my daughter, and now it's COVID, and I'm supposed to be writing a book a month, and I got a two-year-old in the house. And it was very stressful, but I was like, I already told all these people I'm writing a book a month, and they were all asking me. Clients were asking me, friends, like, how's it going with your book? And I really wanted to, like, not do it anymore, but I was like, darn, I already, like, I had, I had um, opened my big mouth and told too many people that I was doing this. So I told my editor, I said, listen, I'm writing, like, 100-page books. They're not going to be real long. I got to write a book a month. And so I think um, this was one of the first books I wrote was How to Find Your Passion. But I wrote a book a month for an entire year. Um, there's, there's one book that is about Billy Ray. It's called Red Dress Energy. And, um, um, and so I, you know, I have some self-help books, some business books, some books for authors. But I wrote a book a month for a year. I wrote, edited, published, launched to the bestsellers list for an entire year. So that was 12 straight books. And then I took those books and I um, repurposed them. I created box sets, audio books, Spanish versions. So I have over 22 um, books now on Amazon. And then a lot of people wanted to write a book a month. So I wrote this book, 28 Books to 100K, telling people how I was able to write a book a month and my system and process that I developed from you know, that experience. And now I have an online course called 28 books to 100k. And I have people literally writing a book a month doing this and creating passive income, by the way, at the end. So my experiment was to see how much passive income I could create at the end of 12 months, it was 3300 a month, which is more than some people get on Social Security. And in 18 months, it was 4800 a month. So I was like, wow, I didn't hit six figures. But I mean, a year later, I was pretty, I was pretty happy. That's amazing. And that's, it is rare. A lot of people yeah. write books and we were just talking. About it. You got to write a lot of books. The Amazon algorithm is keep pumping out new material. They like, you know, the new stuff. And then a year later, like everything's old, right? How do you pick your topics for your books? Well, um, this might sound crazy, but I keep a title book and I've been keeping this for years. So I hear titles like every day. So when somebody can be talking, I go, oh my God, that's a good title. And I'll go write it in my title book. And so in my bedroom, in my, uh, on my little writing desk, I have this book of pages and pages of titles. And so I decided to plan out the year with like, what am I, and, and I, and I did it in like a series of three. So it might be three books about, you know, um, making six figures, three books about, authors and writing three books about, you know, um, self-help stuff for women or whatever. Cause I figured I could take each three and create a box set. So I just went back to my title thing and I kind of said, well, what do I have energy around? What, like, what gets me excited? What, you know, cause that changes. Like you could ask me next month and I might be excited about something else. But at the time I wrote like, this is what I'm going to write for a year. And I would say about 75%, I stuck to it. And then some of the stuff I would try to write and then I'd be like, I didn't feel like the energy and passion around it. So I, I would literally stop after like, you know, 50 pages and I would start something else. And it, it was hard because I had a timeline and I had to do it. So I just tried to write about what I know and what I've done, you know, nothing too crazy. Is, is your process, do you not do so many words a day, so many chapters, so many pages? What yeah, my goal was to do one to two chapters a day. And I then wrote a book called How Not to Write a Book, 12 Things You Should Not Do If You Actually Want to Write and Publish Books. And one of the things I, a chapter I have is called Write in Your Pajamas. Because whenever I said, whenever I did anything, whether it was my meditation or my exercise or my yoga, or I went to Starbucks, I never got to my writing. If, if I didn't roll out of bed and sit in my pajamas at the computer and write, it didn't happen. So I learned don't do anything else. Just roll out of bed, write your two chapters, then live your life, do whatever. So every morning it would be about two weeks and I would write a chapter or two a morning. And then my chapters were like six to eight pages. They weren't very long. And, um, and I would write those chapters and then two weeks into it, I had to give it to the editor because then I needed a week of editing and then I had to get a cover and then, you know, and then we had to put it together and publish it and then launch the book to the bestsellers list. So it was a tight timeline. So it took me about two weeks to write each book. Well, interesting.
Now I do type a hundred words a minute for my time in the legal field. So I'm a fast typer and, um, you know, yeah. I, I, uh, it, 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 it wasn't hard for me to come up with, you know, the topics. That really helps the typing that being able to type really helps <laughs> it did, a lot. I, thought, I remember people going, why are you taking the secretarial course in high school? Yes. I'm, I'm counting myself in here. And it was like the big old typewriters. <laughs> I did too, and it was the book, the, the class that changed my life: business law and typing one hundred and one. Yeah. yeah, and and back then I didn't even anticipate computers were going to be around. It was just something that I thought, I'm well, here. I'm going to have to write a thesis, and you have to type them for university. That was my mindset. And yes. I'm thinking best thing ever. It was it Same was a godsend. Here. Yeah, best class ever. Here's here's my typing. <laughs> hey, but don't discount that. My ex husband <laughs> used to type with these. And he would type faster than, <laughs> like, faster than most well, people. Like, he got back, really fast at it. <laughs> back, when the, back when the pilgrims came over, I took typing in high school, and I could type 45 words a minute. That was on a typewriter. But I never, of course, I, you know, I, after I didn't ever do it. But then when the computers came out, I just never did do it. So, I don't know. Too that old comes now. back easy if you practice, Roy. Just practice. It does come back. Oh, I'm sure you remember in typing class, like you, you had your home keys and they, and they would put paper, copy paper, tape it to the typewriter and you couldn't look at the home keys. You had to have everything memorized and they would take a ruler and hit your hand if you peeked <laughs> underneath the paper. So it was good. <laughs> I just went my piano lessons too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's some strict teachers out there, but it was good for me. I'm glad I learned. Your, your your book, 28 Books to 100K, is it available in, in hardcover or is it only a download? It's ebook, um, paperback, and hardcover. Okay. So if we get one and send it to you, will you autograph it? Absolutely. In fact, I probably have, I have an extra one here. I'll just give me your address and I'll send it to you. I'll sign Perfect. it and send it to you. Perfect. Ha, ha, ha. I'm special. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to say anything Lori, to that, Roy. You Did you just say you're special? <laughs> if you want how to find your passion, I have like ten copies of this here. I have something I want to send that one to Lori. That's my Billy Ray. That's my Billy Ray book. <laughs> oh, so that was fun. That, yeah, it was. How can our listeners reach out to you, Michelle? Um, they can go to bestsellingauthorprogram.com. Uh, they can find me on Amazon, Michelle Culp, K-U-L-P, and all my books are there. And um, people go, are you going to start writing a book a month again? I'm like, well, I took a little break because that was a lot of work and the editing process is not easy. And when you're on a timeline, so I had to take a little break. I'm probably going to get back to, I have like I, ideas for books just come to me every day. So I am getting back to writing. My problem always is, okay, I have 20 ideas, which one am I going to pick? You know what I mean? So that's, and, and that, that's, I think, you know, what blocks a lot of people from writing books. Um, I've helped over 300 authors write, publish, and launch uh, best-selling books. I even have launched books to Wall Street Journal, USA Today, bestseller. Um, and I think what I find with clients that come to me is either they've been trying to write a book for like five years, you know, and it hasn't happened. So when you're on a timeline, you have accountability, like I'm like, this is a 12 week program. And in 12 weeks, you're going to be a best selling author, like your book's going to be written, it's going to be done. I have ghost writing programs, I have ghost writers that'll write the book for you. I've got writing coaches, you know, and, and some authors will write the books themselves, you know, and just We'll have it edited and, and launched. But um, the problem is either I don't know what to write about or I got too many ideas. So we we kind of use data to decide what to write about. Um, I'll give you an example. Like, so I have a lot of ideas to write books. And then what I do is I look for the keywords on a software called um, Publisher Rocket. And if people aren't searching for that topic and it, you know what I mean? There's there's not a yeah, lot of traffic. No market then I don't, then I kill the idea and I move on to the next one. I say, you know what, right now, that's not what people are looking for. And I think that's important. People go, oh, you use SEO and, you know, keywords. I'm like, yeah, I think it's smart because if you don't, that you're either writing to market or you're just writing whatever. And like, if I, would you rather write a book that has like 5,000 searches a month on Amazon or two searches a month on Amazon? You know what I mean? About the topic. And 
Um, if you keep those keywords in your like subtitle, then people actually, you come up in the search for that topic. Like um, one of my top selling books is how to find your passion. It's a highly searched keyword, uh, keywords on Amazon is how to find your passion, how to find your purpose, how to find your calling. So I use all those keywords when I publish so people can find my book. So in other words, write it and they will come doesn't work. No, unfortunately, there, there's a book by Chris Fox called Right to Market, and uh, he makes six six figures, definitely, maybe seven figures from his books, and he said, I didn't start making money till I learned to write to market and what, write what people are want instead of just writing what I wanted to write. I mean, but some people don't feel like that's pure, but I, I mean, you know, it is what it is. You do whatever, but... That's what I, I try to balance like the two. I might have a great idea. Then I go check the keywords. I'm like, nobody, nobody's searching for that. Nobody is interested in that topic right now. It may change down the road, but right now there's no data to support it. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot for being with us. This has been fun. Would you, would you come back at some point? I would love to come back. Definitely. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. It's very much a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, You're welcome. It was. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Bye.